Okay, uh, good morning. Um, uh, Willie, Willie, hi Willie, how you doing? Um, says that he wanted the answer to the uh, riddle the other day. So let me read the riddle. Um, during summer vacation, four children, including Alex, Belinda, and Eric, spend their days at the beach. One day at lunch, their mother asked, did anyone go surfing this morning? The oldest child answers, I wasn't paying very close attention to the others, but I think Alex and Belinda weren't together. However, if Alex did go surfing, it wasn't alone. If Alec, Eric surfed, Alex and Belinda were with him. Who went surfing? Well, the answer, of course, is the oldest child went surfing. Now, nobody gave me a correct answer, and I said there was going to be a prize for this. So the Xbox 95 console with four playing uh, controls and 25 games will uh, not be awarded for uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this one. But I do have another um, uh, riddle, and, and again, there'll be a prize for this one if you, somebody gives me a correct answer. Okay. Grandfather thinks it's time to prepare his will. He has three daughters, Anne, Patrice, and Caroline. Each of his daughters has at least one child. The six grandchildren are Frederick, Gregory, Henry, John, Laura, and Mary. Grandfather wishes each of his grandchildren to receive an equal share, but he can't remember how many children each of his daughters has. However, he does remember that Beatrice has the biggest family. Anne doesn't have a daughter. Mary has two brothers. Henry's brother is six months younger than Gregory. Laura has neither brother nor sister. How many children does each daughter have? Okay, and there will be a prize if somebody gives me the correct answer for this. Um, I've decided to give up on coffee. Um, the apple juice worked much better than the coffee did. Although I have a lot more coffee on the shelf than I do apple juice, and there's very little apple juice left, so it's mostly water. So we're going to... Um, keep watering down the apple juice and see if we can make it last until July 4th. <coughs> we are on chapter 5. Baltazar. This is getting really exciting. They're still on the good ship. Oh, I, I think I ripped the book. Yeah, I did. I ripped the book. Um, this is an old book. Um, so, uh, it's now an old rip book. Um, Okay, chapter 5. We're still on the good ship Goodspeed. And we're sailing across the, um, the Gulf of Mexico on the way to Chiapas, Mexico. And little does he know, Caleb Crabtree is in for quite a surprise. On the morning of the 13th day out, 13th day out of Boston, in the first week of November, they raised the Gulf Coast of Mexico. A low gray blue line on the horizon between the pale blue sky and a blue green sea. As the SS Godspeed got nearer, the vague line resolved itself into a few wharves and dockside warehouses. A town that appeared to be a mere cluster of shacks, and around and behind it an unbroken rank of palm trees stretching out to invisibility along the coast in both directions. The palm trees alternated in type. There would be a forest of lofty, handsome ones, from 60 to 100 feet tall, with graceful, slender trunks and a spray of feather-like fronds at the top. Next to that would be a forest of thick, stumpy palms with broad, frayed, untidy leaves. The ground beneath the palms was well cleared of undergrowth, and cart tracks meandered in and out. What a strange-sounding place. 
Well, said Caleb, complacently, I should think we'll have much trouble making our way through yon jungle. Except that isn't the jungle, Trey told him. They're coconut and banana groves. The tall palms are coconuts, the short ones are bananas. The jungle is something else again. A launch chugged out to meet the Godspeed, bringing a harbor pilot, hardly necessary here, as the approach. The channel was deep and broad, and the only other craft in sight were a few small fishing boats hauled up among the shacks and palms. The launch also brought a customs officer. He lazily climbed the ladder behind the pilot. Uh, let's see, where am I? Okay, here I am. And slouched insolently aboard, unshaven in a rumpled and dirty uniform, picking his teeth with a sliver of bamboo. At Trey's request, he condescended to check out the two passengers first. He gave the luggage only a glance, flipped through their passports, thumped a smeary, rubbery stamp in each, and departed without a word. For the captain's cabin. As the pilot brought the ship toward the dock at the creeping pace, Trey and Caleb could hear Captain Hootsma and the custom agents quarreling over the cargo manifest. The captain's harsh voice got louder and louder. The officer's voice got shrill. But then Trey guessed Captain Hootsma broke out as Holland Gin. For by the time the ship was moored and the gangplank lowered, only gusts of comradely laughter came from the captain's quarters. Apple juice time. Willie said he was counting the number of times I drink apple juice. What is that? Two, Willie? Um, let's see, where am I? Okay, here I am. It was high noon, and the two friendly seamen helped Trey and Caleb carry their bags and trunks off the ship. They descended the gangplank to a wooden dock through the massive mahogany pilings, which supported it. It seemed stout enough. The worst planking was rotted and splintery, and the whole thing swayed, even in the gentle surf of the gulf. They passed through a shed-like building of corrugated iron, fiercely hot and smelling of fish. On the other side, the two sailors set down their bird burdens and cast a contemptuous look up and down the street and a quick farewell, and went back to their ship. Trey was half included, half inclined to follow them. He had been in other Mexican ports, Tampico, from which he had sailed, Veracruz, for Mardi Gras one year, but he had never seen a seaport city so wretched and ugly as that of Coatzacoalcos. Not a single street was paved. They were all clay, deeply rutted, mud. Trey and Caleb were arriving just at the close of the six-month-long rainy season. There was not a building more than one story high to be seen. The few permanent-looking edifices were of corrugated iron, like the one they had just emerged from. They seemed to grow furnace red, furnace red in the midday heat. Every other building they could see was a shack of bamboo stalks held tightly together and upright by lacing of vines and roofed and thatched of banana palm leaves. There was now one another person in sight, but this had not surprised Trey. Even in the temperate zones of Mexico, the Mexicans take a siesta snooze. Oh. Grandpa's going to take a siesta. Oh, okay, 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 that's all. No more siesta. Um, during the hottest part of the day, and do most of their work walking and socializing in the morning or after twilight falls. No, there was one other person trotting anxiously towards him. He was a young man, stockily built and shorter even than Trey, olive-skinned, with black hair curling out from under his immense basket-brimmed sombrero. Uh, he wore, uh, wore the white cotton pajama trousers and loose shirt of a peon, 
and braided thong sandals on his feet. Senor Quaptre! He addressed Caleb, panting slightly, just having trotted across the street in the heat. Mr. Crabtree nodded. The little Mexican immediately loosed the speed of Spanish, going out at some length until Trey cut him off with a gesture and a word. His name is Baltazar, Trey translated, and he comes from Senor Roberto Lacote. He wants to know if you brought the rope. Brought the rope? exclaimed Mr. Crabtree, himself irritable from the heat. Confound it! Does he see a rope? Does he think I'm carrying 18,000 pounds of wire in that suitcase? Tell the little monkey. And why doesn't he know it? I'm here to splice the rope. Trey did that. Baltazar pursed his lips, considered, then jabbered some more. Now, he says, he must have misunderstood the Signor Lecode. Trey told Caleb, because he had to dash out of their camp in such a hurry. He thought his boy's boss said to bring rope, not the rope maker. He had to rush because he had such a long way to come, and it's a long way back again. Anyway, he's to take us through the cod. Uh, Willie, uh, number three. Now he says, he, uh, 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 okay, I read that paragraph already. Let's go to the next paragraph. Well, that's something, said Mr. Crabtree, grudgingly. I had wondered what Lacan didn't send any, me any directions on how to get there. Does this little skeezik speak any English? No. Aren't you glad now you're letting me tag along? Trey turned back to Baltazar and asked in Spanish where they were to start and how. Ah, I've already engaged a boat, a motor boat, said the Mexican with pride. The boatman will carry us east around the, co the coast of Frontera. It's a two-day trip, but that is much quicker than overland. The way I came from, from, from Frontera, we will proceed some distance up the Rio Uncamcinta, as far as the boatman Antonio can go. Then we will take a, a Cayuca and... Cayuca, ex echoed Trey. The word was new to him. Dug out canoe, Baltazar exclaimed. But even by water, we'll be a voyage to tremendous extent. The river is long and twisty, and there are rapids and cataracts, which we have to portage the Cayuca. Far up river, we depart for near a village called Tenasikik. Tenasikik. But from that point, there remains much jungle to cross on foot. More than 150 kilometers, the Salva La Cunda. When do we leave here? Trey asked again. At sunrise, say at 5 o'clock, we shall sail until dark, then camp on shore. The boatman will not risk his valuable vessel by motoring on at night. We will reach Frontera about nightfall on the second day. For now... I will run, veritably run, and engage you a room at this city's finest hotel, the Val Grande. Trey repeated to Caleb all that Belzazar had just told him, and then said to the guide, We have purchases to make, equipment for the expedition. Baltazar gave the mound of luggage a glance, which implied that they were already equipped to travel anywhere from the equator to the South Pole. He looked relieved when Trey added, We would like to store most of this here in Cortes Cacacolas against our return. Certainly, at the hotel. Meanwhile, I suggest you buy the very minimum you will need. We have ample supplies at the camp to equip you and keep you in comfort while you are in residence. Buy only enough to get you there and buy no food. The Indigenas may not welcome strangers, but they will turn no one away hungry. When Trey relayed this to Mr. Crabtree, the man plucked at the fringe of his whisker and said, This camp he's talking about, ask him what it is. What Robert LeCoultre's project is and what the rope is used for. 
Trey did so and reported, he says he is very sorry, but he can't tell you. Oh no. I wonder what they used the rope for. Uh, number four, Willie. Apple juice time. Does he mean he doesn't know? When pressed, Baltazar would only mumble uncomfortably. The Senor Lacoste does not wish word of his enterprise to reach the outside world until he is certain of its success. Until then, his title to it is insecure. I can tell you only that the great rope is used for transport, for transporting material. What the devil are we getting into? growled Caleb. When Trey passed this along, it sounds something less than legal. And I've had seamen tell me what Mexican jails are like. He narrowed his eyes, all as a sign that was that he was turning something around in his mind. Transporting material. Get on with your shopping then, gentlemen, said Baltazar. If the shopkeepers are at siesta, do not hesitate to wake them. They are so seldom they have a customer, I shall kick awake as some porters to convey your luggage to the Valgarande, and I will await you there. He waved the hand up the street. You can't miss it. Then he pointed the other way. Down there is the plaza, shops and stores. Trey and Callop went that way, both of them sweating, as much as Trey had done in the Godspeed's engine room. The little square plaza full of Capte, royal poinciana trees, ablaze with fire, fire orange flowers. They found, found surrounded by rather more respectable buildings of wood and stone. And even one, the church, that towered as high as a three-story building. First they saw it out on a bank, a mere hole in the wall, and found it open for business. They exchanged their U.S. money for Mexican. Two pesos! Two pesos! For one dollar! But soon discovered they had not really been necessary in every shop. After haggling over the price of each purchase, Trey was an old hand at this, he was given a change in a mixture of Mexican money, U.S. coins, British shillings, Dutch guilders, Brazilian guzeros, and various other currencies. In the sailor slop shop, Trey bought each of them a canvas stuffle bag with a padlock and a tin mess kit, two pairs of dungarees, and for himself a sheath knight and a compass. A cobbler's shop provided well-soled mid-calf boots. At a hatter's, they managed to find straw sombreros, something less extravagant than Baltazar's. A weaver sold them a serape apiece, big enough and thick enough to serve as an overcoat, raincoat, or blanket, and two commodious hammocks, a string neck that could be conveniently rolled into a wad no bigger than a loaf of bread. At a pharmacy, they bought citronella to repel insects and the rudiments of a first aid kit, gauze pads, adhesive tape, iodine, aspirin, and liniment. What they needed was some apple juice. Was it five or six, Willie? Finally, when neither of them could think of anything else that they might need, they retraced their steps in the direction of the Hotel Volgrand, which they couldn't miss. Baltazar had been right. The Volgrande boasted a faded wooden sign bearing its name. Otherwise, this cluster of bamboo and thatched shacks was indistinguishable from the non-commercial dwellings all around. Baltazar led them to the hut. Uh, allotted to them. Then promising to be back in the wake of the morning in time to make for a five o'clock departure, he went away. Trey and Kellop spent the afternoon picking out from their luggage other items that they want from the journey and packing their duffel bags. Though, now, though the sun was just setting, 
They found themselves utterly fatigued. They hadn't undertaken much exertion this day, but the unaccustomed heat had simply sapped their energies and their appetites. They decided not to go to dinner in the hotel's dining hut. They went to bed with the sun, went to their cots. That is, no more comfortable than the bunks aboard ship, except that these were draped about with mosquito netting. For a minute, Trey feared that he would not get to sleep. He missed the Godspeed's cradle rocking, but only for a minute. Then he was fast asleep, and it seemed only another minute before Balthazar was shaking him awake. Hey, Trey, get up, get up, get up. Ah, uh, handing him a bun and a cup of hot cafe con leche and urging him into his traveling clothes. Within another half hour, Trey and Caleb we're at sea again. The next chapter is called Doom. Oh, where is it? Doom Country. Ooh. We're getting really exciting here. Uh, here's my bookmark. Okay. Uh, Doom Country comes next. Uh, I'll be reading this next. Don't forget about the riddle. There's a prize for that. Okay. Goodbye.